Hi, this is your host, Sapnil Bharti, and welcome to another episode of TFR Insights. And today we have with us Bruno Kortic, founding VP of Strategy and Solutions at Sumo Logic. Bruno, first of all, it's great to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are a founding VP um, at the company. So let's first start with what is Sumo Logic? How, what problem are you trying to solve for the ecosystem? What are the areas that you operate in? Great. Uh, so Sumo Logic is a continuous intelligence platform uh, delivers a, as a SaaS service. Uh, what that really means is that we collect um, machine data, telemetry, contextual data from digital applications that our customers build, that they serve their customers with, and we collect all of this data in real time across different data types, and we enable our customers to solve a variety of use cases by looking at that data. Uh, they span uh, a wide variety of use cases, starting with operational intelligence, use cases where they're using Sumo Logic to help um, ensure reliability and performance of their digital services and applications. Uh, then we help them with their security. Uh, by helping them um, improve their compliance, detect threats, respond to threats, and defend their uh, security and privacy. And then the third use case is business intelligence, where they're essentially taking this data right as it comes out of these digital applications and from the, from the sort of real production line and are using it for real-time business intelligence to understand how their users are using their digital services and applications, how their applications are performing, how they're delivering value to their customers and so on and so forth. So that's what Sumo Logic is. We are a machine uh, a data analytics service that is delivered as SaaS in a multi-tenant fashion from the cloud. Let's talk about, you know, as companies are embarking on their digital transformation and cloud native journey, what kind of need is there for analysis, you know, or, or you know, to, to analyze the data and use it at, what is the importance in general of observability in today's cloud native world? That's a great question. You know, I'll take a little step back here, if you don't mind. Um, you know, when companies uh, become digital companies, effectively what happens to them is they become a software company, right? Because when you, when you become a digital company, what you need to do is you, you're switching your business model to serve your customers through digital means versus traditional means. And that means that by that time, you no longer can rely on off-the-shelf software like ERP systems and CRM systems to deliver your digital services. In order to differentiate in your, in, your, in your industry, you must build your own software that is finely adapted to the business model that you intend to sort of serve your customers with. And when that happens, that means that the interface, the primary interface between a customer and a business becomes its software, its digital service, whether it be on a mobile app or it be on a web browser or whatever, or, or an IoT device, whatever that might be. And once that happens, the information generated by that interface between a customer and the business, that software, it generates a tremendous amount of information that is invaluable to a digital business to understand how well it's serving its customers, to understand how much, how, where it can improve, to understand its users, and business and security posture and all that stuff. And, and as companies become digital companies, they, as they go through this transformation of becoming a software business, the information that's generated by their digital assets is in, invaluable in, in how they differentiate because it can inform every aspect of a digital business. As companies kind of become software, I, today, I don't think that there's any company that can survive without being a software company, especially if you look at the pandemic, the crisis that we are going through. Only those companies are able to survive or thrive who already had a digital transformation journey. The beauty here is that all these new cloud native technology, they actually enable you to move faster. You know, all those companies, they can very easily, you know, you don't have to build a data center which takes years. You don't have to, you know, procure. You can very quickly move. So while it is important for those companies to be software companies, but if you do look at the cloud native landscape, it's massive. You know, there are so many decisions to be made. If you just pick Kubernetes, for example, it is, you know, it's a very complicated piece. There are so many knobs to be tuned. You have so many components you have to plug in there. So yes, it is important for them to become software company, but they cannot do all of their work themselves. 
So how, you know, how do companies like, you know, uh, Sumo Logic help them to move, uh, uh, to move at their own pace without having to incur either the technological debt or invest heavily into all these, you know, talent and technologies and infrastructure? That's a great question and a loaded one. We could speak for half an hour just about that topic. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, you know, my perspective on so this transformation, technology transformation as you become a software company includes moving into, for example, uh, agile software development from traditional development. Why is that? Well, because not because somebody decided that it's a great idea to make changes in production every day, but it's because why do we accelerate software development and delivery to production? It's because we companies are trying to innovate faster. They're trying to disrupt in their market, deliver products and services quicker to their customers, and, and agile is a way to do that. Cloud is essentially a mirror image of Agile. What cloud enables the customer, if you evolve your software every day, every week, instead of every 18 months, it means that probably it's a good idea to be able to evolve your hardware at the same rate. Because if I'm changing my software constantly, it probably begs to, to have a, the appropriate hardware running under it. So what cloud does for, for enterprises is essentially enables that same rapid rate of change and innovation that the software development uh, business is going through Agile. Now, the challenge is now you've got you know, on-prem, you've got hybrid, you've got cloud, you've got multi-cloud, you've got Kubernetes, microservices, you've got all of these things that are changing. And one of the things that we've discovered when we talk to our customers is that one of the core challenges that they're facing is the skill set, right? It's not possible at this rate to, to hire people by every one of these companies where these people are going to know all of these technologies ahead of time, right? Amazon alone has more than 170 services that they offer to their cloud. Uh, Google does the same, Azure does the same, and everybody else, right? And so now you're talking about hundreds of services, modern architectural paradigms, and enterprises are struggling. One of the answers that we found to this problem is that as a multi-tenant cloud-based service, what we realized early on is that, hey, look, What's happening in our system is that data is flowing from all of these services that our customers are using. The data is flowing through our single backend, right? And what we've actually delivered over the last couple of years is a technology called the Global Intelligence Service, which essentially benchmarks the patterns, common behaviors, events, KPIs from all of these technologies. So that when a customer of ours is, let's say, choosing to adopt like a database, like an RDS in AWS, right? Um, relational database service. You know, they don't have to know everything. Our technology has already benchmarked what RDS should behave like, what insert latency it should have, how it should be deployed for what type of workloads. And essentially, it, it embeds all of that knowledge into our service to help customers adopt these technologies without having to learn everything from scratch in a silo of their own, right? And so we're trying to leverage this crowdsourced intelligence to enable our customers to adopt these technologies because it's not possible for, for everybody to learn all of this at the pace of innovation by these cloud providers. As these technologies are growing, there's also a big gap in supply and demand of talent pool, right? There are not enough people. Also, <laughs> if you just look at you know the announcements, even if you look at Sumo Logic, you know, the new shiny objects keep sh showing up, you know, and it's hard to keep up with that. So how do you also kind of, you know, allow, as you know, initially we were talking about, you know, they can move at their own pace, but the pace of technology is much faster than the pace of a lot of companies. At the same time, with moving too fast, sometimes, you know, you, 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 you can't keep up with that, right? Uh, you want some stability. So there is a lot of balance that you have to put because when you move to managed services, it's opinionated and sometimes companies want their own flexibilities. So, so talk about you know lack of talent, but a lot of new technologies, f fast pace versus slow pace. So there, so talk about you know this is a very so it one can get intimidated, overwhelmed, you know. So so talk about that that how to keep them. Hey, you know what you can leverage all those technologies. You can move at your own pace. You don't have to worry about new release of Kubernetes coming out every now and then. So you're correct. You're correct. Um, so let me let me tell you a little bit of my perspective on on sort of the talent gap and adoption of, of these technologies. Everybody everybody is 
aware that adopting technologies fast is, is beneficial, right? But there's also the how do you actually do it effectively? You know, the pandemic has shown us that uh, companies that were digital ready benefited from being able to adopt the change in behavior by humans like you and, my, you, you and I, who were not able to go shop and get entertainment outside of the house. We all had to do it, you know, in our own homes. And we did it through digital means. And companies that were ready uh, benefited from that. Now, um, one of the ways that we help our customers adopt these technologies is by providing out-of-the-box solutions that are specific to specific technology domains. For example, we have solutions that are, you know, blueprinted for adopting AWS or adopting Kubernetes or adopting, you know, various components like Kafka and, and, and other things, right? And, you know, we provide those out-of-the-box solutions so that our customers don't have to learn everything from scratch. However, we also provide advice to our customers. I, one of my advi uh, advices to enterprises moving to the cloud is, is to not try to move everything up into the cloud and re-architect every application, but take a, a, an important application that everybody cares about, form a small team, build best practices around it, put it into the cloud, re-architect it, learn what works, what doesn't work, create a sort of how to do uh, process for, for other applications in the future, and then start broadening. Like, don't try to do everything. Take a small chunk of it that's, 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 that you can swallow, learn from it, and then proliferate that knowledge throughout the enterprise. Awesome. Thanks for explaining that. It does help a lot you know, in, in, in how to approach there. Now, let's uh, go back to Sumo Logic, and let's talk about the Sumo Logic's observability release. Um, also, I also, once we talk about that, I also want to talk a bit about AI op, you know, uh, ops as well. So, so let's just start with the release first. Sure. Um, so we have been sort of on the observability journey since we started the company, right? We started with, you know, with, with logging and analytics and monitoring, um, and we have been expanding and broadening our capabilities in the observability space uh, since we started the company in 2010. However, uh, earlier, um, uh, uh, a couple of months ago, we released a whole new set of solutions, observability solutions, uh, that now integrate and unify more data sets, more telemetry um, that spans uh, all uh, data, data types from logs to mat time series metrics to traces, uh, combines that into a end-to-end -end observability solution that helps our customers manage their custom workload, their, their digital service that they've created to serve their customers, and then builds and manages the, the environment within, that, within which those applications run. So we've released a new uh, AWS observability solution that deeply understands how AWS services operate, is able to detect anomalous behavior within those services, visualize that information in such a way where users can really quickly determine where the root cause of issues and performance problems uh, exists, We've built the same thing and updated our Kubernetes observability solution, which, which works in a similar way, enables you to really manage your Kubernetes platform. And then if you're running your Kubernetes on top of AWS, now you've got a full end-to-end -end visibility into that infrastructure. And on top of that, we also have expanded the support for you know, how the data types that we collect from various application components, such as databases, queuing systems, web servers, app servers, infrastructure service services from AWS and others, um, and integrate all of that into an end-to-end -end workflow that basically allows our customers to monitor and detect issues and navigates them through an intuitive workflow that's metadata-based to all the way down to the root cause of those issues, right? And that's what we deliver. The whole purpose of this is to help our customers manage reliability of their applications and services, which includes managing availability, managing performance, and managing security of, of these digital services that they built. So if you look at the trends that are going on in, in the industry, what do you think is going to be the role of open source, especially in the cloud native world where, contrary to the previous open source, where you, re, you have complete control over your stack, you run your stack on your own machine here, you can have that source code as open, but it's running on someone else's machine, you know, it's in the cloud. So, so what does it really mean? But you can learn a lot from them. So talk about how do you see the evolution role of open source in 2021? 
Uh, it's a great question. Look, I don't think the golden age of open source is, is behind us. I think it's ahead of us, actually. Um, open source is, you know, is foundational to, to many digital services out there. Uh, I speak uh, to, you know, countless customers of ours who are large enterprises, you know, beginning or well underway in their digital uh, transformation and cloud transformation. And more and more of them these days are comfortable with adopting open source, are choosing to, to rely on open source technologies behind their applications, in their tooling. And open source is also continuing to, to kind of be coupled with open standards, such as open telemetry, for example, that's redefining kind of how enterprises um, of all sizes leverage leverage observability and, and you know what are the standards of communicated information to observability systems like Sumo Logic and others. And we're fully behind that behind that uh, that uh, motion, right? We actually participate in open source communities, contribute to them, and we've actually been increasing uh, how much we've been doing that over time because we see open source more and more important to, to our customers and there's more and more adoption actually because enterprises, if you remember, like you rewind 10 years, you know, open source was Linux, maybe, right? Now open source is every co part of the application component that you can find, right? And, and enterprises are more and more willing to adopt that. And I think we see that and we are going to continue seeing that over the next, you know, not just one year, but multiple years. Yes. I When you said that, I recall my discussion with Sam Ramji. And at one point he said that five to six years from now, we won't even use the term open source. It will become, you know, it will become a synonym to software. When you say software, it, you know, every soft piece of software will be open source. So you're absolutely right about it. Uh, Bruno, thank you so much for taking time out today. Not only to talk, uh, not only talk about Sumo Logic, but also about the wider ecosystem, industry and open source. And I look forward to talk to you again.